Hello and welcome to Dialogue. China has recently rolled out the country's first digital currency mobile app, known as eCNY. The app is still in the developmental phase and it can only be used in a handful of pilot cities as well as the Beijing Winter Olympics area, where the digital yuan will be available for international users. But in just two weeks, the app enjoyed 20 million downloads, and since the digital yuan was introduced in China and promoted last year, there have already been 261 million digital yuan accounts set up. So what is the Chinese digital currency? How does it work? And how will it affect money transactions in the future? To find out, I'm joined by Professor Chen Jun, Executive Dean of the Fanghai International School of Finance of Fudan University, and Dr. William Lee, Chief Economist at the Milken Institute, and Liu Zhiqin, Senior Fellow at the Chongyang Institute for Financial Studies of Renmin University of China. That's our topic. I'm Xu Qinduo. So, Professor Chen, we'll start with you. You know, there's a lot of talk of Chinese digital yuan. Now, officially, the app is available uh, by the name of eCNY. Tell us more about that. What is uh, the Chinese digital currency? So, first of all, uh, the important thing is that this digital currency is issued by the central bank, the People's Bank of China. And China is among the first, the first, actually, that actually roll out a, a what we call CBDC, central bank digital currency. Uh, other countries, other regions, uh, including the ECB, are still in the experimental state stage, uh, whereas China has already rolled out. And as, uh, as you already mentioned, uh, it's been used in uh, 10 cities, and uh, it will be used in upcoming uh, Winter Olympics in uh, Beijing. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, the first important thing is that it's it's uh, issued by the central bank and two its current function is to replace some of the cash coins uh the traditional electronic uh money that's already in circulation so if we use uh language in uh, money and banking uh it's playing it's currently playing the role of m0 m0 Okay, we will take a look uh, in a closer look at that later on, probably. Uh, but the Chen, you know, I, I think in particular for Chinese consumers, we are all familiar with uh, you know WeChat Pay, Alipay, which has been around us for a long time. So, how different is the digital yuan uh, from WeChat Pay or Alipay? That's a good question. So, first of all, we need to understand Alipay and WeChat Pay. Uh, these are what we called uh, third-party payment system companies. Their job is to facilitate a monetary transaction to go through more quickly and more efficiently in the financial system. Uh, importantly, uh, the digital uh, yuan uh, is not issued directly from the central bank to millions of Chinese customers. They are issued through what we call PSPs, payment service providers. Uh, that includes commercial banks, and very importantly, both Alipay and WeChat Pay are now PSPs. That is, uh, people now can receive and use digital currency through both WeChat Pay and Alipay. So, you know, again, so Alipay and WeChat Pay are platforms that facilitate uh, payment and transactions, and now you can regard uh, our digital RMB as an additional device, additional payment choice on these platforms. Okay, uh, Professor Liu Zhiqing, you know, so it is the difference mostly seems to be, you know, you know, which side provides such a service, you know, central bank or PSP over there. Uh, but from a consumer's point of view, I mean, it makes a little difference, right? It's just one way of paying whatever you buy. Yes, uh, actually, we have to say that uh, this is uh, one of the uh, modernized uh, payment tool. In, when we are uh, talking about this uh, digital currency, especially for in the market, in the, in the retail, in the shopping, this is quite uh, more convenient and uh, more security. Also, it, when we compare it with the other uh, means and other methods, uh, as uh, we already get used uh, to Alipay on the chat pay. The, we find that the two, two things are, are, are totally different because digital pay or digital currency is more convenient, it's more safety, 
it's better that uh, that we can take all this uh, digital currency that as a major payment tool instead of auto to uh, supplement this uh, uh, Alipay and the other ways of payment. So by doing so that we can see the more security and the more convenient and the more uh, uh, effective in this way. So not only that uh, we call, we're talking that uh, for the normal consumers in China, for those public uh, people, for senior uh, users and applicants, they are also trying to get used to have the digital uh, currency pay. This is another uh, best provider for the, for the market choice. I mean uh, that the, we should not have any monopoly for payment way. So mm -hmm. we should have more chances and more ways to okay. convenient people. Okay. Uh, so William, obviously, I mean, the app has been here, you know, in the last uh, few weeks, but, uh, you know, Digital Yuan has been around for nearly two years. Uh, so is app availability another substanti substantial step for the promotion of the use of the Chinese Digital Yuan? I think the biggest move that's, uh, that's happening with the app, especially as it's being used in the Olympics, is the ability for foreigners to be able to transact in renminbi uh, conveniently, rather than my having to go to a, a money changer to change my US dollars for uh, the renminbi, I, I can now, uh, using a digital currency issued by the central bank and using that app, have that transaction essentially consolidated with myself and the central bank. So there's no concern about um, uh, changing the exchange rate uh, that, that I can convert my dollar, I can get at the official rate. Um, but I think that in the discussion that we've had so far, uh, one of the things that we should note is that the digital currency is a tremendous advance as we go into the digital age. We are moving away from paper and analog currency, right? The, the stuff that we have to hold in our hands to an electronic payment. Now, WeChat Alipay has been so convenient in China, just as credit cards and other electronic payments have been so convenient here in the United States. I think these are all better ways of doing transactions. The real difference with the central bank digital currency, the, the digital renminbi, is that you have no counterparty risk. You don't have any fear that the, the credit card company, the, the bank issuing the, the electronic payment will, will go out of business uh, or, or there's a case of fraud. And I think one of the things that um, is an advance that the China has, has really led the way is to be able to consolidate the benefits of electronic payment uh, um, and, and take away the, what's known as counterparty risk. That is, the, the, the vehicle that you're using to do the transaction is solid as the, the currency itself. And I think that's the important move. Mm -hmm. uh, well, William, you know, sometimes people are confused with, uh, you know, between digital currency and the crypt cryptocurrency. Uh, China joined uh, other, you know, dozens of countries actually uh, issued a complete, a sweeping ban on the use of uh, cryptocurrency, I think in May, uh, basically the ban of uh, uh, crypto transaction, and then in June, uh, the ban of uh, the mining of crypto, and in September, uh, cryptocurrency transaction uh, completed ban. Uh, so tell us, first of all, you know, why is the ban? What is the rationale behind that move? One of the things that every central bank wants to be able to do is control the amount of currency and money supply in circulation. That is one of the key tools for monetary policy. Uh, with the issuance of cryptocurrency, you, you get a sense that there's a, 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 a possibility that there'll be more credit in the economy than the policymakers desire. Uh, so there's, uh, you know, when there's too much currency chasing too few goods, that's the classic setup for inflation or the other way around, not enough currency for all the goods available. That's a classic uh, setup for disinflation or deflation. And those are the kind of things that most central banks want to avoid. So I think China's thinking behind and many other central banks thinking is they want to be able to have control over the amount of credit extended the economy. I personally think it's a mistake to ban uh, the cryptocurrencies because there, you need to separate the technology itself of crypto with the policy issues of money supply. Crypto represents development of technology for encrypting transactions and ensuring cybersecurity. And one of the things that as we move into digital age, we have to recognize is the need for cybersecurity. And the private sector's development of 
different cryptocurrencies and, diff and the use of these encryption algorithms is a very key development toward ensuring security in the safety of the transaction. Central banks, I think uh, other central banks have really uh, gone into business with the private developers of cryptocurrency to expand this use of technology uh, going forward. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, Professor Chen, you know, what's the discussion inside China? Do people all agree that, uh, you know, the, the ban is, is uh, say, the positive step, the right step? Uh, so we have now a digital currency yuan, and we don't need this uh, development of a cryptocurrency. First of all, <clears throat> I would like to add another important reason uh, for China, among other countries, to ban the cryptocurrency like Bitcoin is that... <clears throat> Uh, for a number of reasons, uh, especially for Bitcoin, a significant amount of transactions are used by are used by are used to facilitate illegal uh, uh, actions and money laundering. Uh, in fact, there was uh, at least one academic paper published in the journal Finance, uh, you know, uh, the best journal in finance, that estimated for Bitcoin up to forty percent of the transactions were illegal. Uh, 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 and that's, that's a huge problem. Uh, a, a financial innovation, if it's used primarily, uh, even though it's not its original intention, but if ended up being used to facilitate illegal transactions, uh, that's, that's not good uh, mm -hmm. innovation. Mm -hmm. So I, I will say this. I would. I'm. I'm. I agree with the decision to ban cryptocurrencies for now, right? Now, in the future, uh, as uh, 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 Mr. Lee said, uh, cryptocurrencies themselves and also the trading platform of these cryptocurrencies are also undergoing uh, reforms, uh, regulations, if you will, self-regulations, to make themselves more transparent, to make themselves subject to some type of monitoring and regulation, which, and by regulation. the way, that was not the origin. The, that was not the original design. Mm -hmm. So we can imagine, at some time in the future, as uh, uh, as the digital currency, as the digital RMB becomes more popular in China, and when China feels it can clearly monitor a lot of these uh, transactions uh, using other cryptocurrencies. Maybe there, maybe the decision could be uh, could be changed. Yeah, could be temporary. Uh, well, Zhi Qian, here uh, you have, uh, you know, we are talking about this digital yuan. Obviously, the, uh, it has some advantages, in particular from the point of view of the central government. Uh, uh, some people would say, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's traceability. For example, it's easier for the government to fight against the corruption, illegal transactions, including tax evasion or this uh, money laundering. Is that the case? But at the same time, you know, people would worry about their privacy, uh, privacy protection over there. Yes, I, th <coughs> I think it's a quite important issue that we have to discuss the legal position of this uh, uh, digital currency in China. As we know that uh, people at the very beginning that are worrying about uh, money laundering or tax uh, evasion or some other illegal activities by using such payment. By Doing so that we have already built up our uh, overall this uh, law system supervisor uh, mechanism to monitor and to supervise all the activities. I think the best advantage of this uh, digital currency transfer in China transaction is that it's very clear and it's easy to trust by the monitor or uh, some uh, authorizations which big amount of transaction which might be illegal transaction could be found out immediately and can be warned in the in, uh, by the internet in the computer system uh, informed to all partners that are concerned so this is the best way i think is a very important uh, advantage for this uh, digital currency in china as especially when china now is facing some challenges uh, uncertainty from outside the global market we know that some uh, global uh, provider, they have some other uh, technology try to interrupt China's uh, um, monetary policy. So in this way, that by Chinese way that of monitoring and supervising our digital currency transfer is quite an important sector to stabilize 
our financial sector, especially the banking system, is very important and essential. I have to say this is very crucial mm -hmm. for the further development of China's economy in this year and the next year. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Chen, they have a feature they called like uh, uh, controllable anonymity. Uh, basically, meaning like if it's a large amount of a transaction, then uh, there's it's traceable. But if it's a small amount of a transaction, basically cash, no, it's uh, anonymous. Is that the case? I believe so. Uh, so there are two issues here. One is the design, and the other is the implementation and execution. So uh, if you if you look at the design of the digital RMB, uh, clearly the designers, which is the central bank. Uh, want to keep a balance of both convenience, quick, accurate, uh, under uh, attractable, but also uh, uh, maintain, uh, uh, protect the privacy of uh, 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 the participants of the transactions for a certain amount. And that's why you, you've seen the term controllable uh, anonymity, right? And we, we are, we are so that's, that's the design, all right? So try to keep a balance. In execution, on the other hand, actually this, uh, this is a pretty, it has to have a sophisticated system to do both, right? So, so let's say that they have a threshold or, or, or a bunch of thresholds on the size of the transaction. So if you're large enough transaction, it will be monitored, uh, it will be tractable. As uh, Professor Liu said, if it's fully tractable uh, between, the, uh, between the consumers and the PSPs, essentially uh, money laundering can no longer happen, right? Because, because you can catch them instantaneously. And in fact, because everybody has an account at the central bank, you can actually rever reverse that transaction. You can void that transaction. So that's very good. But because for small transactions, which actually may happen more frequently, uh, you don't track them. Essentially, for, for on the technology, you need you need two systems, mm -hmm. right? And then the two systems need to uh, uh, work together. And the other thing that's very important uh, for execution is that the, the PBOC, our, our central bank, has already said uh, it's the digital currency is replacing some, but not all of the cash. So what that means is in the foreseeable future, we're going to have the traditional RMB, whether that's in paper form, coin form, or electronic form, and the ECNY. What that means is that you also need the traditional system and the new system, and the, all of these systems need to uh, coordinate. And uh, so, so all in all, I think the design is great. Uh, in execution, we need to see more details. And uh, it, it, uh, it uh, requires a lot of uh, coordination uh, among the different systems. But I, 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 I believe uh, uh, the PBOC has the capacity uh, to do all, all, all the above. That's probably why it is uh, being piloted uh, you know, in 10 cities plus this uh, Winter Olympic uh, area. Uh, so William, you know, another feature probably you know, people tend to uh, focus on is really about this, uh, you know, even without internet access, you can still do transaction with NFC technology, and also people call it a hard you know, wallet, uh, in particular you know, to cater to these uh, senior people who are not really tech savvy, and it's easier for them to say this will help narrow this uh, you know, digital gap. Uh, is that the case? I think that's also one of the great conveniences of any kind of electronic form of payment, which is that uh, if you lose that wallet, that hard wallet, you can go to the central bank or whoever the issuer is and try to get, get it back. And the security surrounding the use of that uh, depends on your per personal PIN or, or, or however it's implemented. One of the things that we need to distinguish, as, as uh, Professor Jun just said, is implementation versus the technology. Um, there, there, there are different models of digital currency available. Hard wallets uh, can be issued by the central bank, can be issued by private banks, uh, and, and it could be a two-stage model where the private banks themselves issue the, 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 the means of payment, the wallet itself, to the retail customer, and the, 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 the bank itself has an account with the central bank, or the central bank can deal with the public directly. Uh, those models are still under, under study, and I think there's no clear decision as to which is best, but I think one of the key things about digital currency is its security 
and 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 avoiding loss. And I think that's uh, that's the development that China has really led the way with. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Zhu Qian, you know, the, uh, over the past uh, you know, year also with the app available now, uh, there are some, as we said, you know, 261 million digital accounts uh, set up, basically like uh, one-fifth of the Chinese population, 261 million. That's a lot. But if you look at the transaction, the volume is quite limited. And so why, in, you know, it's not doing as much transaction, say, as, uh, you know, WeChat Pay or Alipay? I think at this moment uh, we need uh, some time to uh, take a research. After the such research, we have to review the whole process, and uh, we will find some more challenges and other opportunities. As we know that at the very beginning, people in China are skeptic or, or not so familiar with uh, digital currency because they could not find the big difference between the digital currencies and other currencies, especially for Alipay and other pay. So that by doing so, uh, at, at the very beginning, it's uh, very prudent and uh, very cautious from the central bank has issued uh, such policy. As we know that, that all these uh, application areas are limited in five or six uh, limited areas. For instance, only for uh, shopping, for some uh, retailing and uh, catering, even for some uh, tourist uh, traveling. So it's not a big event, for instance, for big business transactions or trading or big uh, foreign trade or import or export, for instance. So only by doing in this limited area, limited applications area, so I think the amount is limited, is log logical, is logic. So by doing so that we can gather more experiences, what the people are feeling, what the advantage they are enjoying, and what the problem where could be happening. So how to deal with this solution? So that's why we need uh, such a test period in order to get more experience uh, to test our whether design is right and uh, execution is good and also the result is positive. By doing so, we can promote to the market. So mm -hmm. everything will be decided and promoted by the market demand. I hope that in the short time, these uh, digital currencies will be more popular here. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Chen Juan, of course, the uh, promotion of the use of digital yuan. Uh, an official from the central bank, and PBOC, said that uh, their relationship with uh, you know, Alipay and WeChat Pay is not a competition. Uh, the digital yuan is a component, uh, is a complement, actually, to this uh, you know, market practice here. But the long-term uh, point of view, somehow you have to compete probably with Alipay and uh, WeChat Pay in order to promote the use of the digital yuan? Um, well, again, um, in the short run, uh, as I said, uh, Alipay and WeChat Pay, among, there are actually other uh, third-party third payment system companies. Uh, the, 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 the service they provide, as I said earlier, is to use technology and sometimes credit enhancement to facilitate the completion of a transaction. As Mr. Lee said, uh, in, under the traditional currency, there's always this counterparty risk, right? Because, you know, even between two banks, you don't know whether the other, whether the other bank, uh, a particular account in the other bank has enough money to clear the transaction. Mm -hmm. Now, when, when the digital currency, when, when, when the digital RMB is, fully, is, is in full circulation, there won't be such problem. So, so what that means is the service provided by companies like WeChat Pay and Alipay in this regard will be diminished when uh, the digital uh, currency is in full uh, uh, use. But as we have discussed, I, I think that's a long way from, uh, from okay. now. At the, at the moment, uh, the, 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 the digital RMB is M0, and as I said, uh, both WeChat Pay and Alipay are among the PSPs, payment providers. They are the intermediaries connecting the central bank, the issuer, and the ultimate users. So, so just like uh, people, when they open their Alipay platform, they have another choice. Uh, I do want to add that, you know, with, with the app of the digital RMB itself, I do think it will gain popularity very quickly because 
you know, a lot of these new electronic devices, you, you actually rely on the young people to use it. Uh, but once, once the young people are familiar with the app, uh, which is very important, I, I do believe uh, mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in a short period of time, you will gain, the, the popularity will gain, actually gain uh, a lot faster than before. Okay. Uh, William, uh, you mentioned about the Winter Olympics and a good chance to introduce the RM, you know, digital RMB to uh, users outside China, actually. Uh, speak of that, wh what about its impact on the possible, pro probably possible promotion, say, uh, internationalization of yuan and uh, you know uh, cross-border payment for example using digital B uh, digital RMB what, what is that the kind of prospect that to me is the most exciting part about having a central bank digital currency is to facilitate international transactions to be able to pay remittances across borders and will facilitate trade uh, in, in, a, in a way that lowers transactions costs right now we rely on banks and other credit issuers to clear transactions across borders is in, in different currencies. Uh, with a digital currency issued by the central bank, uh, we no longer have to rely on SWIFT, the, the international payment system uh, that reconciles these different transactions across different payers. Uh, it can be done much more directly because the, the chain going from buyer to seller will be much more direct and will be much more secure. Right now, we are depending upon these third-party providers to clear these transactions, but having the, the, the digital currencies involved will make it much more official and, late, and losing that counterparty risk, and as well as being able to make the use of one currency much easier. Once you have the use of one currency much easier, then you have international competition for what's known as a reserve currency. What currency do you prefer to use? And right now, the dollar has that role because every, everyone denominates in US, in U.S. dollars. Oil is priced in U.S. dollars. Many commodities are priced in U.S. dollars. But that's because of the convenience of the dollar and its pervasiveness throughout the world. When you make transactions easier in alternative currencies, then you create a competition for that status of reserve currency. And it could well be that if China has a lot of transactions with, say, Africa because of the commodity trade, um, they will prefer to have transactions denominated in the yuan. And, and that would be a very natural development in the course of trade. And, and I think that's the, one of the big means by which the internationalization of the renminbi can be promoted. Mm -hmm. Well, William, you mentioned about the, the SWIFT, uh, you know, international payment system. Uh, you know, people would complain, you know, it's a bit slow. And also politics, uh, you know, comes in, like the U.S. recently uh, threatened Russia. They could be kicked out, out of this SWIFT system. Uh, so somehow will the digital yuan uh, impact uh, the future of SWIFT? Well, SWIFT is going to have to make some severe changes in lowering the cost of, of effecting these transactions. And I think in terms of, of policy uh, enactment, that is, if, uh, if certain countries are considered to be sanctionable countries for so, so undesirable policies, um, the, the, the ability to sanction a country will be limited because these digital currencies can facilitate bilateral uh, or regional transactions, multi, limited multilateral transactions. So the, the power of the transaction becomes the dominant force in deciding what currency to use. If the trade is extensive between a band, uh, like for example, South Africa, uh, they, they had a lot of gold, diamonds, and other trade that people wanted to engage uh, with South Africa. And despite the bans that were put in place, there were still a lot of transactions taking place. So, so I think one of the things that we need to worry about with the digital currency is that uh, uh, it may facilitate transactions which are considered undesirable internationally by the general consensus of international policymakers. Part of the politics. So, well, thank you, uh, William. On that note, we conclude today's show. Uh, again, many thanks to our guests. You can also find us on the CGTN app or on YouTube. I'm Xu Qinduo. You can find me on Twitter, Xu Qinduo, in one word. Thank you for being with us. See you next time.